When President Shagari swept back to power, the warning signs were loud and clear. Nigeria's economy in a terrible mess. Widespread corruption at the highest government levels. Shagari tried to combat both. Only two days ago, he announced tough austerity measures. But Nigeria's debts have piled up alarmingly since the oil boom of the 70s collapsed. Now, Nigeria's new military rulers have accused Shagari and his government of turning the country into a debtor and beggar nation. Many fear what the military's solution to the crisis will now be. In 1975, General Mutala Mohammed ousted General Yakubu Gowan, the military head of state at the time, in a bloodless palace coup, but announced that he would relinquish power to civilian rule by 1979. The following year, however, General Mutala Mohammed was assassinated during an unsuccessful bloody coup by Colonel Bukar Sukar Dimka and his colleagues, and leadership was passed to General Olusegu Nabasanjo, Mutala's deputy. During Obasanjo's three years as head of state, he emerged as an important African statesman and established strong ties with the United States. He followed in his predecessor's timetable for a return to civilian rule, and after a closely contested election in August 1979, General Obasanjo handed over to Shehu Usman Shagari, a school teacher from Sokoto State, making him the first democratically elected president in Nigeria. Between 1979 and 1983, the military essentially acted as a government in waiting. The military saw itself as a national government custodian and an emergency rescue team that could be called out to depose the civilian government anytime the public got fed up with its policies. Although the soldiers were back to military duties, the senior officer corps consisted mostly of officers who had been members of the last military government that stepped down in 1979. Approximately, 30 senior officers were SMC members or military governors in the last military government. Some of these officers included Lieutenant Generals Gibson Jalo and Inua Wushishi, Major Generals Ibrahim Babangida, Muhammadu Buhari and Domkat Bali, Brigadier Tunde Idiagbon, Ebitu Ukiwe, Mutala Nyako and Godwin Ndubisi Kanu of the Navy among others. Even President Shehu Shagari's own Chief of Guards, Colonel Bello Khalil, was a member of the previous military government. Even though Nigeria now had a democratically elected government in place, some senior military officers did not stop engaging in politics. Some senior military officers drafted a list of government ministers they wanted President Shagari to remove and nominated their preferred replacements. They delegated their boss and chief of army staff, General Wushishi, to submit the lists on their behalf. President Shagari had to constantly cope with political interference from senior military officers and manage military egos. Relations with the Shagari government and some other senior military officers, such as Major General Muhammadu Buhari, became strained. Major General Buhari was in charge of the troops sent to Nigeria's northeastern borders region in 1983 to prevent infiltration of armed rebels from the neighboring Republic of Chad. After successfully repelling the Chadian rebels from the border area, the troops advanced several kilometers into Chadian territory. The political hierarchy ordered Buhari to withdraw his troops, but he refused, arguing that the Chadian rebels would return to the area as soon as his troops had vacated there. Buhari's view was that it was futile to risk the lives of soldiers by confronting the rebels, only to withdraw and allow them to return once the objective had been achieved. President Shagari had to enlist the support of General Buhari's superior officers, Lieutenant Generals Jalo and Wushishi, to order him to pull back. Buhari was said to have lost confidence in Shagari, and the incident created tension between the two, so much so that the Transport Minister Umaru Diko placed Buhari under surveillance. The Shagari government received multiple warnings of coup plots against it as the Director General of the Nigerian Security Organization, Umaru Shinkafi, detected up to 10 coup plots against Shagari. However, most of them were merely rumors that the government could not act on. Civilians and military played a cat and mouse game, with the civilians trying to pacify the military and military prowling and looking out for political errors 
that would justify a return to military rule. Senior officers considered overthrowing the government as far back as 1982, but restrained themselves as the political climate was not yet ripe for a coup. The planned coup were not in response to adverse political events, rather they were opportunistic. They planned first and then the planners waited for the government to make mistakes that would justify the coup execution. In the words of General Ibrahim Babangida, we could have toppled the government in 1982 before the elections. But then we said no, because the people might go against us. We knew damn well that they were not going to conduct that election freely and fairly, and therefore we waited for the right time. You see, to stage a coup, there is one basic element that everybody looks for. There must be frustration in the society. So by 1983, when we voted, everybody was not happy. There were complaints over this and that, and the frustration built gradually. We found the coup easier when there was frustration in the land. The political class continually fell into every trap set for them by the military conspirators. It is a known fact that the military always enjoyed widespread public support anytime it deposed an elected government. The military were always cajoled into political power and welcomed as heroic redeemers after each coup. The military did not wait for long for its opportunity to strike as politicians became entangled in one corruption scandal after another. This culminated in a rancorous and rigged election in October 1983, which saw President Shagari re-elected for his second and final term of office. There seems to have been a conscious plot to depose Shagari inside the army and another one among the civil society. President Shagari claimed that after he was re-elected, frustrated opposition politicians who were defeated in the elections colluded with and incited the army to depose him through a military coup d'etat. The army had civilian accomplices, one of whom was the southern multi-billionaire businessman Moshud Abiola. Abiola was a close friend of General Ibrahim Babangida for over two decades, and his publishing empire was used to launch frequent antagonistic attacks on the government, with the intention of discrediting it sufficiently to psychologically prepare the public for his replacement by a military regime. General Babangida would later confirm Abiola's role in financing the plot against Shagari and using his influence to destabilize Shagari's government. He revealed that Abiola was very good in trying to mold public perception through media. Babangida also revealed that they relied for him a lot for that, so there was both the media support and financial support. Abiola hoped he would benefit from the NPN's zoning system. His expectation was that when President Shagari's term of office expired, the NPN would zone the presidency to the south and he would be allowed to run it as his presidential candidate. However, things didn't work out as he expected, as his presidential ambition was rebuffed by the powerful Minister of Transport, Omaru Diku, when he told him that the presidency is not up for sale to the highest bidder. Abiola retired from politics soon after, totally frustrated with the NPN. He would have his revenge later, re-emerging from the shadows to play a key role in Nigeria's political history. But we'll get to that story later. A source named General Babangida as the big masquerade behind the coup plot against President Shagari's government. And yet, the general was adept at concealing the plot from Shagari. Assuming that senior officers held on to regional and ethnic loyalties, Shagari, from all appearances, did not seem in danger. And that is because he entrusted his personal security to individuals from his home state of Sokoto in the Northwest. The commander of the Brigade of Guards, Commissioner of Police in Lagos, the GOC of the Army 2nd Division, and the Director General of the NSO were all from Sokoto State. However, Shagari's insufficient knowledge about the intricacies of coup plotting and military postings played a part in his downfall. If he had studied previous coups, he would have noticed that they have almost always been carried out by the same group of military officers. If President Shagari had acted decisively early in his first term, in his position as the commander-in-chief of the armed forces and retired his officers, perhaps his government might have survived yet another coup plot. Many of the officers plotting Shagari's ouster were stationed in or in close proximity to Lagos. Among these officers were Major General Ibrahim Babangida, Brigadier Sani Abacha, Brigadier Tunde Idiagbon, Colonel Aliu Mohamed, and Major Sambu Dasuki. In addition to the officers mentioned, 
A formidable cabal of military coup conspirators had also assembled across the country, including Major General Muhammad Buhari, Brigadier Ibrahim Baku, Lieutenant Colonel Haliru Akilu, Lieutenant Colonel David Mark, Lieutenant Colonel Tunde Obeha, Major Abdul Mumuni Aliu, Major Lawan Gwadabi, Major Mustafa Haruna Jokolo, and Major Abubakar Umar. In President Shagari's memoir, Beckon to Serve, he also accused former head of states, General Olushegun Obasanjo, of engaging in coup baiting against his government. Coup baiting is a term employed to describe the deliberate preparation of civil and military political opinion for a coup. Shagari alleged that Obasanjo and other retired officers severely criticized his regime with the aim of inciting the military to overthrow him. Shagari's observations are given merit by a subsequent interview with General Babangida, in which Babangida claimed that the original aim of the plot was to bring back Obasanjo to power. Obasanjo declined as he felt it would destroy his credibility as a statesman. However, he did not try to dissuade the conspirators from overthrowing Shagari. Babangida himself was approached to become the new head of state, but he too declined. The stage was set for another military rescue operation, and it was only a question of when, not if, the military would strike. The plotters decided early on in their plans that the coup should take place without bloodshed, and to ensure this, Colonel Tunde Ogbeha was tasked with arranging the peaceful surrender of the Abuja Brigade of Guards. The Brigade of Guards is the army unit detailed to protect the head of state. Colonel Ogbeha traveled from Lagos to Abuja to repress and convince them to surrender without a fight. However, when he arrived in Abuja, Ogbeha discovered that the brigade's commander, Colonel Khalil, had traveled to Lagos. Ogbeha headed back to Lagos to find Khalil, but by the time he arrived there, Khalil had traveled back to Abuja. Ogbeha once again headed back to Abuja, but by this time, Khalil, who was no stranger to coup intricacies, had become suspicious. He relayed orders to his men in Abuja, instructing them to resist any attempt by unauthorized officers to get near President Shagari. Brigadier Ibrahim Baku was tasked with the responsibility of arresting President Shagari after Shagari's guards had supposedly been neutralized by Colonel Ogbeha. Baku traveled to Abuja with an armed detachment of soldiers to effect what he thought would be a peaceful surrender of Shagari and his guards. Unfortunately for Baku, the plot had leaked to Shagari and the guard brigade troops were put on high alert around the state house. Colonel Khalil was also informed about the plot, but unknown to him, his deputy and other members of his unit were among the conspirators. Khalil was arrested and detained. The brigade major of the brigade of guards at Boni Camp was one Lieutenant Colonel Mike Yoshi. Around 2.30 a.m. of December 31st, 1983, armed troops moved to strategic locations set up roadblocks and took over the radio and television stations in Lagos. All communication lines were severed and airports, border crossings and ports were closed. Armored vehicles thronged Bonny Camp, which the coup plotters used as their tactical headquarters. Back at State House Abuja, President Shagari was awoken by his security men in the early hours of the morning and evacuated from the State House to safety when information reached him that troops led by Brigadier Ibrahim Baku were on their way to arrest him. After arriving in Mufti to take Shagare into custody from what he thought were pacified guards, Brigadier Ibrahim Baku was killed in a crossfire that ensued between his troop and Shagare's guards. President Shagare escaped and hid at a farm on the outskirts of Kefi and then later moved to a village called Tunga in Nasarawa state. He remained there in hiding and only emerged after he was given assurances of his safety by the military. President Shagari was taken into detention where he was kept largely incommunicado until July 1986. His oldest son, Captain Mohammed Shagari, was retired from the army and another son, Musa Shagari, was dismissed from the Air Force Military School, JOS. Many of the soldiers used for the operation were tutored by Major General Ibrahim Babangida during his days as an instructor at the NDA. At 7 a.m., Normal radio and television programming was interrupted by martial music. 
I and my colleagues in the armed forces have been discharged of our national role as promoters and protectors of our national interest, decided to effect a change in the leadership of the government of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and form a federal military government. This task has just been completed. Accordingly, Alahaji Shehu Usman Shagari ceases forthwith to be President and Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces of Nigeria. Brigadier Tunde Idiagbon made another broadcast shortly after midday, telling Nigerians to stand by for further announcements. President Shehu Shagari was overthrown only three months after being re-elected for his second and final term in office in an election that was marred by accusations of electoral malpractice. A faction of the military government that had handed power to Shagari in 1979 returned four years later to take it back from him. Major General Muhammadu Buhari became the new head of state. He claimed that he had no idea he was going to be appointed head of state until after the coup had been executed and a plane was sent to fly him down to Lagos from Jos. His appointment was announced in his broadcast to the nation on Sunday, January 1st, 1984. The disciplined, tough and stoic Brigadier Tunde Idiagbon was appointed Buhari's deputy as the chief of staff Supreme Headquarters.